Hare Krishna. So I'm supposed to speak in English or Hindi or what's going on here? English, English, English. English, English ya yeah, English. English ka matlab adhunik Hindi. Wo door close karo, yehi English, English bro. All right. You don't have satarangis for everyone to sit on? This, uh, what do you call that, rug? Rug? Because sitting on this floor is actually very bad for health. It's better to put mats, yeah. You don't know that? You shouldn't. This, it takes all the pran out of the body. You'll get all kinds of problems. One devotee was telling me his son is, um, he's part of that 24-hour kirtan group in, in uh, Vrindavan, and they just sit on the stone floor, or just very thin rug. And so the effect, of, he's getting so many kidney problems because of that, actually. It's, in Shastra it said that one should do puja not sitting on the floor directly, one should sit on a mat. And there may be other reasons, but I think one main reason is that it's just very bad for health to do so. What about Anuvadam? Koi hejo angrezi ne semaste keo ache je angrezi bujena apne bujena maneho ustapachan Hindi. Chika che cholbe. English shiki fella cho. Act to act. All right. If anyone needs translation, please can that be arranged? Aap ke liye? Anuvad? You do not understand English? Hindi semester. So someone can do translation for her? Yeah, so now everyone sit it on some mat. Even the plastic mat is not so good. <laughs> for health also. It's not just a matter of uh, <coughs> of tr being traditional, but uh, just like this kushasan, yeah, I know. That uh, that that's very good for health, but this plastic is not. Everything, out of, yeah. So that traditional culture, it's it's good for health and it's good for spi good for spiritual realization. This plastic, it's artificial, and it, it makes the consciousness also artificial. So, uh, there are many things in Vedic culture which, uh, which are good for health, which people used to know and follow. But nowadays they don't know and they don't follow. And people have so many diseases. Just like they thought that, that uh, we'll use fertilizers and pesticides and we'll increase the crop. So it was good for a short time. It's just exactly like the mode of passion. This Rajagum. It looks good in the beginning, but at the end it's distressful. But now they find that you have to put more and more fertilizer and more and more pesticide. And the farmers are all getting cancer from this pesticide. And the, the, the people in general are all getting cancer. Just like, uh, say, 40 years ago in India, cancer was not common. Is that correct? Who can say? From the older generation? It was uncommon, wasn't it? But now it's very common. Diabetes, cancer, these have become very common. 
It's due to the modern way of life. Well, cancer, that, there are various reasons. One of the main reasons is that the use of pesticides in food. And Indian farmers, they put more. Because in India, everyone does everything to the extreme. It's like, you know, they don't just use spices. They put lots of chilies. And they don't ju when they use a loudspeaker, they always put it like, you know, full blast. No one ever puts a loudspeaker on anything less than full so, with pesticides, they, instead of putting the amount they're supposed to put, they put ten times more, and the government gives subsidies. And then the farmers, they're the main ones getting cancer. And everyone else is getting cancer also. And diabetes, yeah, because people don't do any exercise. People used to know all, so many things that you have to do for health. Rising early in the morning, it's not just for spiritual life, but it's for, for health also. Even in the West, there's a saying, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. But nowadays, people are all unhealthy. They think they're wealthy if they have some tin can car. And they're not at all wise. There's no wisdom. People are simply foolish. Maybe, mm -hmm. Mataji, you could move in a bit, because you're sitting in the doorway there. It's a bit of an slight obstruction in the doorway. You also sit on a mat. Do you need a chair? So uh, this Vedic culture, it's in all ways better, materially and spiritually, or traditional culture in general. All over the world, People are following the American way of life. Either they're following it or they're rebelling against it. This fundamentalism coming out of certain Islamic countries, it's a rebellion against the American way of life. And to some extent, I sympathize with them because the modern way of life, well, it, dis it promotes selfishness. Because the, I the modern way of life is based on consumerism, that everyone should buy more and more and more things. And that makes, so it's necessary to make people greedy. And that's done through the medium of advertisements, which are, which create desires in people for things that they don't want. Just like I often give the example of Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, the company spends billions of dollars every year on advertising because if they didn't, no one would ever buy Coca-Cola because there's no need for it and it's not... I mean, I didn't drink one for about 35 years but as far as I can remember, it's not very... There's nothing very special about it anyway. It doesn't taste very nice. So they have to create desires in people to buy things more and more and more. Just like fashion. You see, if you if you get a if you get a good pair of right, pants. Now, of course, in Indian culture, people don't wear pants. They wear either dhoti, men wear dhotis or vestis or lungis, which is actually much more uh, suitable for the hot Indian climate. But nowadays they like to wear jeans and, and there's different, they've created a fashion industry. And the idea is that now this is in fashion, now something else is in fashion. Because actually if you buy a pair of pants, it should last for a few years. But if it lasts for a few years, then the manufacturer doesn't have much business. So you have to constantly change the fashion. Srila Prabhupada wrote in our purport that about this changing fashion, it's all nonsense. He said in our Krishna conscious movement, we have one fashion. Dhotis, tilak and shaved heads with shika. That's the men's fashion. And for the ladies, he didn't mention, but... That would be saris, tilak, and then 
And then, then there's hairstyle fashion. No. Hairstyle for ladies means it's uh, not cut. No styling. The only styling is making the choti, this braid at the back. So all these, uh, all this Vedic culture, it's, it's conducive to self-realization. Although it's not the same exactly in all parts of India, the culture, but it's the, the traditional understanding in the, what we can call the Indian way of life is that the spiritual life is more important, or at least we can say religious life is more important than material life. Even if everybody, everybody wasn't a great saint, but at least they understood that the, the highest or the best position is that of a sadhu. And I don't mean sadhu, just someone who wanders around begging, but a real sadhu. They're the, they're the actually exalted people. That was respected. Even the kings, they would, with so much power and money, they would respect someone who has no money at all, voluntarily, voluntary poverty. Srila Prabhupada told the story <coughs> of one king in Krishnanaga. So he... he King would they would go out around their territory and he came across one Brahmin who was living in just a ramshackle hut and he had a few boys with him. The Brahmins they would live like that. They would have a few boys, they'd teach them Guruku. Guruku didn't mean a big building with fans and but just at the edge of the village or in the, just inside the forest, uh, a man would live with his wife, generally, as a rishi, like that with his children. And a few boys would come to him and he would teach them. That's all. And teach them means there's no government syllabus, but whatever he learned from his guru, he would teach. And the main teaching was character training. There's both. There was no certificate, this MSc, PhD, no certificate. This, this is the certificate. This Janaya or Yagyopavita, that is the certificate. That was respected because those who wore it, they were supposed to be of, of Brahminical qualities. They, People now, are, of course, the caste system is largely finished to a large extent in modern India. But up to a recent time, the Brahmins were respected largely for being born in Brahmin families, or they would demand respect on that basis. But previously, the respect was given because the Brahmins were actually. Uh, detached or if they were actually detached then they were respected no one likes a greedy brahmana we, we hear stories just like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu at his wedding it's described at his wedding with Vishnu Priya the, the, the gifts were being given out to the brahmins and they'd see that one brahmin come and take his gifts and then come back you know half an hour later and come again and pretend that he hadn't. So then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, give them all double so they can be happy. So no one is, feels dissatisfied. So like that, no one likes a greedy Brahmana, one who simply, he's looking for where he can get a good feast and where he can get lots of dakshina. No one likes that. Of course, a Brahmana, he may go if there's a need of dakshina, he may go. Just like if he wants to get married, he, he may go to a king and uh, request some dakshina. 
But that's not considered very good, to go to the king and ask for something. I was just about to tell that story of the king of Krishnanaga, Prabhupada told that he saw this Brahmin as living in a very run-down way. And he said, well, let me, let me offer something to you. And the Brahmin, didn't, he didn't want to take anything. Well, how are you living? Just a very poor way. He said, yeah, well, you see that uh, my disciples, these boys, they go and beg a little rice and dal every day from the village. People would have no objection because everyone would have a little land and they'd grow rice and they'd have a big stock of rice and they didn't mind to give a handful every day. There's no problem for them. So a rice, the disciples collect and you see we take some leaves from the tamarind tree or some... They're just... In Bengal you'll find these wild pot herbs or sharks. They just grow everywhere. You can just pick them up and cook it and we're living like that. So people didn't mind to give because they could see that these people are selfless. And that people had the idea that just by, by giving to them, we are benefited. We are not the loser. They don't complain. Oh, the, these brahmacharis coming every day and my giving the, I have to give rice and the stock is going down. They wouldn't think like that. They think, no, Bhagavan gives. What, he has, what we have in stock, that is given by him. And by giving to the brahmanas, we give to Bhagavan, because they are the representatives of Bhagavan on the earth. There wasn't, there, was, there wasn't this idea that, well, I have to save everything for myself, don't give anything to anyone, that uh, there's... A, even today, there are people who recognize this principle that those who give, they will always get. If you give in charity, then you will get. God will arrange. There's that, uh, at, what's the name of the place? Subramanya in, uh, is that the name of the place? In uh, Karnataka. They have there's there's the James. What what's the name of that family? They, the the Dharma stuff. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hegde. Yeah. So they uh, actually they're James, but the worship is going on there, conducted by Madhva Brahmins of uh, Shiva. I I haven't been there, but uh, they're very much respected people in Karnataka. And they're very wealthy, and they give anyone who they feed everyone who goes there, and uh, they give for educational institutions. They have their own educational institutions, and they they in the beginning when all this was set up, the principle was given that if you just keep on giving, and you will get. So temples are meant for that also. Of course, temples in this part of the world, it's a little different to in other parts of the world. There are certain considerations by which this temple doesn't fun in some ways doesn't function like other temples. But temples, they are, well, the temple is the center I still didn't finish that Krishna Naga story. Anyway, anyway, the temples, they are the, the center of the village. And people's spiritual, religious, social, cultural, all their needs are fulfilled there. When I say spiritual and religious, there is a difference. Because spiritual means what is concerned with the essence of life. And religious, that generally refers to some kind of rituals. By spiritual, we mean jnana kanda and bhakti mark. And by religious, we mean karma kanda. That's even this uh, one of our devotees, when 
he met Dr. Abdul Kalam when Dr. Kalam was the president of India and he introduced I'm from ISKCON which is a spiritual organization and Dr. Kalam said yes that's very good we want spiritual organizations not religious organizations religious means it tends to be sectarianism but if there's if it's genuinely spiritual then there won't be sectarianism so anyway the temples I'm talking as you can understand I'm talking in a very general way this evening because I don't prepare any lecture and Whatever comes in my mind, I speak about. So we started off speaking about the, you should sit on the mat on the floor. And then we spoke about, talking about the traditional culture and the benefits. So now we're going that way. I, I, this is a topic I'm very much concerned with. I made this book, Glimpses of Traditional Indian Life. So that's something I've been studying throughout my life. And I... If Krishna allows, I'd like to write more books on these topics also. Because it's very important for human society to have the proper culture by which we can progress toward the ultimate goal of life, namely Krishna consciousness. So anyway, the temples, they fulfilled the spiritual need. That means there were... The spiritual need means that uh, hopefully there would be Brahmanas of genuine spiritual disposition and certainly of religious disposition, they would perform different rites. Apart from the regular, the Brahmanas, apart from the regular pujas, they would also perform various functions for the local people, such as giving astrological calculations and helping with the various sanskars. Beginning, beginning with Garbhadhan Samskar and going right up to Antyeshti and even beyond that Shrad. So all the, the, the Brahmanas, they would help with this. They would give advice as required. And like this, they were, they were religious guides and uh, uh, all kinds of, of course, they're, they're the Nitya Karmas, Naimitic Karmas, like uh, Griha Pravesh, they were all these things. And uh, even though most Brahmanas would be Karma Kandi, but the temple would be a place where the, the traveling sannyasis would come and those who are uh, promoting genuine spiritual consciousness or those who are on a platform beyond the day-to-day -day religious, those who are interested in yadgatvana nivartante tadhama paramam mama, going to the spiritual world, they would come from time to time, that would facilitate that, and people could come and hear and associate with such persons. The cultural needs, there are cultural needs because in human society, there are in every society there's art, dance, drama, uh, literature, all these different things. So all this would be of a religious orientation. When the cinema first came in India, it was all uh, Mahabharata and Ramayan stories and there's that's what it was. And then gradually they started to make the Krishna Leela, you know, the, the, the Ras Leela with lots of, you know, kind of sexy overtones. They kind of introduced it like that. And nowadays it's uh, totally gross, much of the cinema. And not, not very religious. Although there still is in India that. It's amazing that despite the influence of atheism, still Indian people, there's still many who are attracted to the original culture. So anyway, talking about the temples, they fulfill the cultural needs, social needs, because people need to get, people like to come together and talk and meet each other. Not everyone's going to be a great sadhu or a great saint. 
but at least everyone can recognize there is God and we need to worship Him and therefore they may come to the temple and some people will be very abs in the temple some people will be very absorbed in godly activities and some will come they're not ungodly they recognize God but they're more interested in chit chatting and this and that with their friends but the, so this, the temple also provides a, the facility for the social needs so we may say well that's not very spiritual well maybe not but on the other hand if people if come to the temple and socialize it's better than going to a bar or a club and socializing people have that need so that can be fulfilled at least they'll come to the temple and they'll bow down before the Lord and see the R.O.T. and all these things and they'll be saved from bars and clubs and parties and all such degrading things so the temple was the center of spiritual culture and getting back to that point of charity that one of the most important functions of the temple is distribution of prasad and uh, everyone who comes should get some prasad Srila Prabhupada was very concerned that anyone who came to our temples they would get some prasad I personally saw this in London in 1975 or 1976 in one, there was a darshan going on with Srila Prabhupada and one young Indian couple came in and they didn't stay and listen, they just came and bowed down before Prabhupada. Prabhupada was going on talking, mostly to his disciples and they weren't interested in listening or they didn't have time or whatever. So they just came and bowed time, bowed down and left or after you know maybe one or two minutes. And Srila Prabhupada noticed them and said to some of his disciples, make sure they get some prasad. So I can understand that Srila Prabhupada is very concerned with this, that not everybody is on the platform of Shravana Dasha. This is one of the stages described in the uh, advancement of Krishna consciousness. On, when one comes to the platform being able to hear so we find that all over the world, I, I, I don't know if it's true in Bahrain, well I do know that it's true, but I don't have to test. But all over the world, we find that at our festivals, usually on Sunday or here on Friday, that most people or many people turn up just a little bit before Prasanta. It's true here also. I know it's true, I didn't have to ask you, because it's true everywhere. And if you ask them, and say, oh, I, I, I was very busy, and this and that, and there's traffic jam, and somehow they just managed to come, you know, like 10 minutes or 2 minutes before Prasad is served. And it's true everywhere. And it's always going to be like that, probably. <coughs> but we don't deny them. And of course, if they're initiated devotees, then that's not very good. They should come and participate in the function. But it's a beginning. Of course, we don't want to feed... The, the temple shouldn't become simply a place for free feeding. That people come every day just to fill their bellies. Because we want to inculcate the mood of service to Bhagawan. So if they think that the temple is a place just from, I can get free food. So they think that, that it's just a place where I can benefit, I can save my money for wine. If I don't have to spend money for food, I can drink more wine. They may think like that. They're maybe not in India, but in other parts of the world, that has been there. In fact, in England, one newspaper gave a complaint about people from Italy coming to England and just living off the... coming to London 
and just living off the local charities and, not, and just being a burden on society. And they said that one of the places they go daily to the Hare Krishna temple for lunch because we have a free lunch program. And they would come daily for that. So after that complaint came in the newspaper, actually the devotees stopped doing that, feeding people who weren't interested. They were just coming simply to take advantage. But if people come once a week, or they come for prasad, well, like I say, at least it's some kind of touch with Krishna. If they come, at least they'll bow down before the Lord. And prasad itself is, has its own <coughs> purifying effect. So it's a beginning. And we can try to find the ways to engage people. We could ask them maybe that uh, you can give some donation or you can help clean up or something like this. You can, if people are not interested in hearing, we can try and engage them in other ways. Everyone should try to engage others. So the temple is a, a place where everyone can come together and at their various levels engage in activities of Krishna consciousness and the idea is to gradually bring them up. And even though it may not, it may be that people are not on a very exalted platform, but that effect of going to the temple, that will remain in their consciousness. In this, in this book is an interview with Narmada Swami, who's now passed away, who was from uh, Nella in Andhra Pradesh. So there is a temple of Ranganatha Swami. It's a big temple, not as big as in Sri Ranga. So he related how as a child, he used to go daily to the temple for two reasons. Because there's a big courtyard, he would play with his friends. And the Archaka, or the priest, would every day give them some prasad. And it was delicious. And he said, I had no idea of anything very religious, but later on, that because I was going every day to the temple, every day see the Lord, at least they'd come and like this, something would be there. So that impression, later, when he came in contact with devotees, and he was... His father was a businessman and he was, a, he was also doing, he was a building contractor, but at some point he felt, now my children are grown up and there's no need for me to stay here. Let me come to bhakti full time. So that impression was there. And we find also these children, they're very lucky children. Because from the beginning of life, they have the contact with Krishna Bhakti. I'm, I, you know, now I've been in this Krishna conscious movement for more than a generation. So I've, I, there's one boy in Dubai. He's just going to go to Chennai to enter college. So then I realize, oh, he's 18 years old. That means I've been coming to Dubai at least 18 years because I was there when he was just born. <laughs> and his parents always tell me that, well, you were the first to bless him. There's Gorangi here also. She also. How old is Gorangi? Where is she? How old? First 10. 10. So, means I've been coming here at least, actually more than 10 years because like that. She was a little baby. Now, a young Vaishnavi. 
So we see that, that children who are raised in this atmosphere, they grow up with that and they'll never lose that impression. Some of them may not, children of devotees, some of them may grow up to be very staunch devotees and some of them may go through a little, you know, let's find out what the material world's all about. But they'll never forget that. And we're seeing, I, I'm seeing, I'm seeing that uh, many of the children of our devotees, they, they like to practice and become initiated also. Recently one devotee, his daughter was approaching me for initiation and uh, I asked her then, why are you approaching me in particular? She said, well, I just remember that you always used to come to our house when I was a child. So I know you since I was a young child. So, like that. Or someone, another daughter of a devotee was approaching me for initiation because uh, something had happened that uh, her mother had told me when she was about five years ago, she was in school and then in Krishna conscious wise, she wasn't doing too well and someone in Russia had given me a gold ring but I don't wear rings, so I, I told you, give this ring to her. It's prasad from, it was offered to the deity. So she remembered that and she said, oh. So and then later she wants to take up bhakti very seriously. And so like this, the, the, the impressions that we receive in early life, they're very important. I know myself that the impressions in my early life are all bad. And sometimes we become shocked when we see, when we see that uh, many actually of Prabhupada's disciples. Yeah, please come forward. Come, you have close association with devotees. You can all move closer to me. I'm not in the I'm not in the fire breathing mode at the moment, <laughs> as I often am. So, maybe it'll come a little later. So, uh, yeah, yeah it, it may be surprising that many of Srila Prabhupada's disciples, you know, they didn't uh, maintain the principles of Krishna consciousness. But I mean, many things could be said about this, but one point is that the impressions that we get in the, uh, in the early part of life are very powerful. They're very powerful, either good or bad. A Jamil, he had some good impression from his early life. And he fell down very badly. But that, the worship of Narayana that he performed in his childhood or in his youth, that saved him at the end. Because he never forgot that. It was deep in his subconsciousness. He never forgot it. So he can act the other way also. Bhakti is very powerful. But if we don't cultivate it very carefully, then we're in danger of falling away. And for persons raised in the Western culture, going back to their culture means a very serious fall down. Uh, I mean, among people from Indian Hindu background also, there are people who get initiated, and later on they don't follow very strictly. But their falling away is not likely to be as serious as the falling away of persons who come from a very sinful background. They, may, they might start, you know, watching TV and maybe even smoking or something like this, but it's only unlikely that uh, they're going to indulge in grossly sinful activities. But in the Western world, that's normal. 
I mean grossly, grossly sinful. Double plus sinful. Of course, in India, that's becoming normal also. Unfortunately. But still, Indians have got a long way to go to catch up with the West, in many ways, in terms of degradation. However hard Indians try, it's difficult for them to be as degraded as Westerners. I'm not saying this to denigrate Westerners, but I mean, I'm coming from that background myself. Don't I know it? But um, it's a fact that everyone is born into various situations according to their previous sanskars. So we who are born in the Western countries, there's those uh, sanskars are reinforced by uh, so much sinful life. And so if we don't practice Krishna consciousness very carefully and very strongly or if we make some offenses, then devotees can fall away and they can fall very badly. Srila Prabhupada said, don't be surprised who goes, be surprised who stays. Because for anyone in the modern world to stay in, especially in the Western world where the atmosphere is one of very strong sense enjoyment, uh, it's amazing that there's anyone who's practicing or able to practice Krishna consciousness very strongly. In fact, in the Western world especially, if you don't practice Krishna consciousness very strongly, then you'll really get in trouble. Because the surrounding culture is very powerfully dragging people down. We find that in uh, many Indians, actually, who come from what we would call good backgrounds in India, they go to the West and phew, they become degraded very quickly. because their, their senses become attracted to, the, oh, you can do... You see all these people, everyone here is eating meat and it's just normal for them and drinking and smoking and womanizing. They think, well, it looks great, you know. And many of them fall down. And others, they see this and they think, whoa, I don't want this. They see and they, it seems to them so gross that then they want to find some shelter and so... We find it's quite common that devote or not devote people who come from India to the West. In India, they weren't interested, but when they come to the West, they take up Krishna consciousness. We find that in the Gulf countries also, because people they're surrounded by an an alien culture, and probably the Indians in the Gulf in general are more religious than in India, isn't it? I mean, even if it's, you know, like some completely bogus group, but still, everyone, more or less, everyone's doing something religious, which isn't true in India. Every Friday they'll go to some satsang, even if it's what we would call an asatsang. But there's a feeling that we have to do something to maintain our culture and protect ourselves from... Otherwise... What is this? There's this harsh, what, what will be perceived as a kind of harsh alien culture. So, back to the general discussion here that culture is very important. Do you agree? All right, that's good. So, you're dressed in a nice Indian style of dress, whereas most of the girls in India will be dressed in jeans. And in fact, sometimes we find that even the girls, they want to wear what we would call a nice, chaste dress. But the parents are saying, why don't you wear jeans? They're pushing them. Why don't you wear jeans and t-shirt? They want to wear salwar kameez and dopata. Why are you dressing like that? You should wear jeans and tight T-shirt, which is actually vulgar. I mean, when this first started in India, 
It was considered very bad, very low class, maybe 20 years ago, for girls to wear clothes which just show the whole shape of their body. But now it's considered normal. So that's a cultural fall down. They've adopted the Western way, which is meant for sense gratification, gross sense gratification. It actually degrades women. They think, well, we have freedom. But that kind of freedom is not very desirable. The freedom to show your body to everyone, that is not very desirable. And actually, this, uh, the traditional dress is much nicer anyway. Some jeans, it just looks horrible, doesn't it? So, like that. Ladies like to dress nicely, so you dress nicely and come before the Lord. Some of Srila Prabhupada's disciples, lady disciples, they were dressing because they thought we should be very renounced. So they were dressing in very, you know, like worn out saris like this. And Prabhupada told one of his disciples, Krishna does not like ugly gopis. <laughs> So, uh, women, they like to dress nicely, so that's auspicious if they come to the temple or some social occasion. Nice, nicely dressed means not jeans and t-shirt, but like this. And they, of course, maybe I shouldn't be saying these things as a sannyasi. The traditional dress is their sari with bangles and the hair parted in the middle and at the back tied up with the sindur and bindi. Red, red, and there's one other... Well, the hands can also be red with this uh, mahindi. And the feet also, with alta. You know that, alta? Any ladies still wear that? No, they stopped doing that. No? Anyone? Sometimes, yeah. But it used to be daily, yeah? on special occasions. But it used to be done daily, huh? because it's considered auspicious. It's very auspicious. <coughs> so like that, this traditional culture, it... Uh, it fo you see, that fosters a sense of uh, respectability. I'm talking about the women's, their dress, and that fosters a sense of respectability. You see, if a woman is married and has children and she's husband and wife together are training their children to be well-behaved, religious, good citizens, and they don't have to be very rich, but they'll, they'll, that's respectable. Nowadays, one is considered respectable only if he has money and a big position. But... Uh, Formerly, that money didn't matter. Just like the Brahmins, they would be, they would deliberately be poverty-stricken because they, they didn't want. What shall we do with money? Every day, God is giving food. We don't need money. Our, the uh, one common word we'll find in Mahabharat for the Brahmanas, they're addressed as tapodhanam. Their dhana is tapasya. That is their Dhana. In uh, Dubai, one lady, she came to me. Well, she was in one class, and up, she's the mother of one of my disciples. So she came and said, well, actually in India I never came close to ISKCON because I thought it was only for the rich people. So I told her, Abhi Dhani Banja. Bhakti hi dhanhe. That's the real wealth. What is the use of having crores of rupees if we don't have any devotion to Krishna? So, like that, the Vedic culture, that gives a sense of uh, respectability, 
That's also required. Why should everyone... What's the opposite? The opposite is a completely whimsical way of life, which is in the modern world. You see the men, they, uh, they don't... Men and women, they, don't, they get married. The first marriage is like a kind of trial. You know, they're just practicing. And they go through a few practices and like that. It's just a normal thing that people marry, they have maybe one or two children, and then they get divorced. But this is not human life. You get married once. Of course, a man may marry several times. In Vedic culture, that was... You may do, the Kshatriyas especially. Because as Prabhupada said, naturally there are always more women than men in society and uh, some of the men become renunciants also so and all the women should be married so the system was some men would take more than one wife <coughs> it's very difficult in the modern age because it's very expensive to me. It's very difficult to get married, actually. People say that, I want to get married, but I don't have enough money. I have to make some arrangement for income. But previously, there was no problem, actually, because there was land, and people would live on the land. And uh, like that, people didn't have many needs. They were, you didn't have to spend lakhs and lakhs of rupees for your children's education. Like that, the brahmana would teach free. And he, if you tried to pay him, he'd get upset. It's insulting. He said, I'll send my son and how much money do you need? No, just regularly give some dakshina, that's all. Not payment. Dakshina is not payment. It's not donation either. Dakshina is not donation. Dakshina is an offering out of respect. It's not, dakshina doesn't mean that I'm giving a donation. The idea is that I have something which I'm, I'm benefiting you. If you say donation, dana, I'm giving something to benefit you. But dakshina means I'm giving for my own benefit. That by giving to, by offering this to you, I shall be benefited. You don't really need that but you are kindly accepting it to benefit me. That's the understanding behind Dakshina. <coughs> so education was free. And most there was no need of all this complex, technical education. Simply if a father, if a man was a potter, his sons would learn, and daughters also probably, it's not a very difficult thing to learn. They would learn, and, there, and there's always work as a potter. There's clay cups to be made, and then these for deepums, and then bigger clay pots uh, for water, and then always for religious functions. There's always a need. for So they, they always have uh, occupation, and their needs are provided for. Actually, the brahmana wasn't paid, no one was paid. The barber, he wouldn't get paid either. He'd, he would sh when, he was when he was required, he would shave people, that's all. They wouldn't pay him. It wasn't that shaving in 12 rupees or 20 rupees, no such thing. He would shave, and then uh, at the, uh, every year in the harvest time, people would give some portion to the barber or the dhobi or whatever. And then the barber would come for marriages also and they'd be given some cloth and different... Like this, life went on. The needs were not great and society was not very complex. And uh, even if one was not very rich or was quite poor, but still they'd get married and they'd pull on. There was no need that, well, first of all, I have to get an... PhD and then pay off my debts for my education and then at the age of 35 I can get married when you're already half dead. <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, society, it was actually, society was much better. It's time to move forward again, please. Must be getting close to Prasad time. <laughs> Sorry for the facetiousness. So actually, Srila Prabhupada, he wanted to revive this Vedic culture. Srila Prabhupada had the idea to make farm communities where devotees can live simply. If you think farm, oh, it's so much hard work. Well, it is some hard work, no doubt. But with many people to help, then a lot of the time there's not hard work. There's hard work at... well. It, for each rice crop, there's sowing, replanting, and harvesting. And in between, there's not that much to do. So Srila Prabhupada had the idea, you can live simply, and then you'll have time for bhakti. Because in the modern age, people don't have time. People are so busy. You have to work hard, long hours, and starting from the there's kindergarten, pre-kindergarten, starting from the age of like two or something. The children, they start getting the educational line and then they're drilled hard. And life from just from the beginning is just stress, just all stress. And people don't have time for proper sadhana. Time is required. To chant 16 good rounds every day, which is the minimum, takes at least one and a half hours. And then we're supposed to, you know, kirtan, classes, personal study, and worshipping the deities. I mean to perform the minimum sadhana program that Śrīla Prabhupāda set up in his temples, at least, for devotees, takes about six hours every day. But people don't have that kind of time. Between, between getting ready to go to work, going to work, working and coming back, it takes up almost all their day. And then you're exhausted and you know you have to sleep and it takes time to eat and brush your teeth and all this kind of thing. So Prabhupada recommended this farm community. And we say, well, it's hard work. Well, everyone's working hard anyway. But people think, well, it's better to work in an office with an air conditioner. But actually it's more healthy, maybe a little austerity, but it's more healthy to work on the land. And farm community anyway, it doesn't mean that everyone's a farmer. There are also doctors and teachers and priests, although everyone would have a little land which they would cultivate. Kitchen garden. Like this. So this was Srila Prabhupada's idea that devotees, they could get free from this grind of material, the modern materialistic life which just crushes everyone. It's like everyone has to just work hard and work hard, earn money and be a consumer. Everyone should buy lots of things. You need so many things. The basic needs in human life are ahara nidra bhayamaitun. These are the basic needs of the body. And for bhaya we need not worry too much. And if one's a sannyasi, then he doesn't have to worry about maitun. But most uh, most people are married, so for that they need roti kapra makan or idli kapra makan. Depends which part of India you are from. We need food, shelter, and clothing. And by the grace of God, in most parts of the world. These things are provided by nature. You don't need to fly in daily fresh vegetables from another part of the world. But 
in most parts of the world, these things are available. And most of India, before they spoiled everything with by over-fertilizing it, etc., the land is quite fertile. And there's enough rain that you can have two or maybe three crops a year of rice, or wheat, or ragi, or jowar, or whatever the local grains are, and vegetables. Vegetables just grow in many places, even if you don't plant them, they just grow. And uh, the, the, the housing materials are everywhere. You can make houses out of mud. People don't know that. In our center in Salem in South India recently, we made the ashram out of just the mud of the land that we'd purchased and uh, mix that with some straw and just some little lime and that was it. Big thick walls, no electricity and uh, you can, th th there are plenty of houses all over South India made from these materials. From outside you can't tell the difference but actually they're like two, three hundred, four hundred years old and they're just made out of mud. In Bengal also, houses are made out of mud, but they have to be rebuilt regularly. It's a different kind of clay. And you'll find in different places, houses are made of wood. There's plenty of wood available. They make houses out of wood. In, <coughs> in Orissa, many houses are made out of big, big, they have made out of big pieces of stone like this, local material. So, by the grace of God, there's roti, roti, uh, food is available, house, housing materials are available, and uh, clothing, that also, from cotton or silk, these are the cotton, wool, silk, jute can also be used for, in the, uh, for clothing. So these are natural materials and we can live by the, in the lap of nature and chant Hare Krishna. No need for cell phones. Uh, I recently visited a pilot farm community in Karnataka, Iskon devotees, community. Please move in again. There's more, there's more space, plenty of space, actually. So there's, in that community, or just, there was, community means it's quite small at the present time. Devotees have got beautiful cows, desi, desi ga. They don't give as much milk, but the milk is better quality and they don't have so many diseases or problems. Desi ga. You all understand what that means? It means indigenous Indian cows rather than the mixed jersey or something like that. So one devotee was telling me there that physically it's difficult, we accept. If you're used to the comfortable life of the city, then physically it's difficult. They have to carry water from the stream, they have to bring it up. But he said mentally, you see people are coming in and sitting right in the doorway. They should, you have to tell them to come inside. Otherwise again and again we have to move up. People don't think. They sit. They come and sit right in the doorway. Yeah, so he was saying, but mentally it's so much better. You don't realize we're in, when we're in the city how much we're mentally bombarded, you see. All the time there's billboards and there's this atmosphere of stress. And everyone's in competition with everyone else and there's always you know, time, you have to rush, this, that. 
He said, but when you come here, there's no electricity. At night, you can just see the stars. It's completely peaceful atmosphere. And for the mind, it's so peaceful. So, it's better to have a little physical hardship. And then, uh, but the mind becomes much more peaceful. And the inclination toward Krishna consciousness is, is more likely to arise in a situation where there's no gross sense gratification. Because bhoga ishvarya prasaktanam taya bhakrita chaitasam vivasaya atmaka buddhi samadho navidhiyate. People who are attracted to material enjoyment and opulence, they can't get the firm resolution to be Krishna conscious. So that simple living, it's actually very conducive for spiritual life. And also if we live on the land, then we realize how we are dependent upon God. If we live in the city, then we think that water comes from a tap or a bottle. We think that food comes from a shop. If we live on the land, we understand that we're, we're completely dependent upon nature and that there is a higher controller. We are not the, in, in the city life, tends to, modern city life means, tends to think, I am the controller. I can do what I like. But in the, in the living on the land, we realize that we're, we're dependent on the, on the rain, the sun. If there's not enough sun, then the mangoes don't grow and ripen properly. If there's not enough rain or there's too much rain, then the crops don't come properly. So we realize that we're dependent upon a higher power. And we're grateful to Krishna because we can directly see his hand in our maintenance. Whereas in the city we think, I am maintaining myself. I work hard, I get money, and I buy whatever I need. But we don't realize that all these things come from Krishna. You see in Bahrain, if they stop the flights and the shipping, you know, within a week everyone would be starving, isn't it? And not only Bahrain, it's you now all these big cities, they're all dependent upon, upon daily. They have to bring milk and vegetables, and daily they require to be brought in. If there's any disruption, then city life it can't go on. It's, it's completely dependent upon this artificial thing of daily driving in or flying in, food. But in the village, you see the direct connection that this is given by Bhagavan. This is His mercy. So we should offer that to Him and take His prasad. And that food is actually very nourishing and very tasty. No one in the modern age knows what food tastes like because what really fresh food tastes like because they never get it. In the modern age, we couldn't imagine, at least in our childhood, we couldn't imagine that you would buy water for drinking. But nowadays, you can't imagine not buying water for drinking. And even maybe two generations ago, people couldn't imagine buying milk. No one would buy milk. There's no such thing as buying milk. Everyone would have a cow or two. And if you needed, if there was some special function in your home or something, you just ask someone for some more milk. That's all. No one would sell milk. There's no question of selling milk. And that sounds very strange nowadays, doesn't it? But maybe two generations ago, there was no selling milk. <laughs> this whole modern society, everything is, has to be paid for. 
But previously, people were like that. They'd live in the village and uh, they'd help each other out and cooperate in Krishna consciousness. Of course, there may have been problems also. That's natural in Kali Yoga especially. But Srila Prabhupada wanted these farm communities where we can live simply and naturally and put Krishna in the center and cultivate Krishna consciousness without the disturbance of modern life and without all the uh, degradation of modern life. We can see in India in the last 15 years how the influence of the modern society is just, it's just, the whole culture has gone down. Just a few nights ago in Sharjah, we came out from doing a program, 11 o'clock at night, and just we were sitting in the car and we saw one young Indian girl walking alone, alone at night, 11 o'clock at night. And I commented that that was, you know, a few years ago that was unthinkable, that a, a young girl can walk around by herself at 11 o'clock at night, but nowadays it's normal. And I say, well, that's good, they've got more freedom. But again, that freedom to become degraded, that kind of freedom is not very desirable. Better not to have the freedom and to remain respectable and protected from fall down. Otherwise, how can you be a proper wife if you want to wander around by yourself? But the wife's duty is to serve the husband and the family elders and look after the children. She requires to be at home, not wandering around. But if they have a practice to wander around any time of day and night by themselves, then after marriage also, they say, oh, why are you restricting me? And then they can't be proper wives or mothers. Then they're just what Prabhupada calls society girls, which is a polite way of saying prostitutes, actually. And they're just freely, they're free, it means they're freely available to anyone according to their whim. So the culture is going down very badly. And it will be a great service to human society if ISKCON can take the lead in uh, maintaining and reviving this culture and showing the real purpose of it, which is to lead people to Krishna consciousness. So there are some general thoughts about what we call Indian culture, which is actually Vedic culture, which is Men for understanding Krishna, which arose, this general discussion arose from seeing all of you sitting on the floor without any mat, and then you pulled out the plastic mats. If you can find some, you might want to get some grass mats, although they're difficult to find nowadays in India then you can't find them any, everywhere. It's only in certain... This plastic mat you can get everywhere. But the grass mats, you have to look... You have to know where they are or look around to find them. Hmm? Nowadays, it's often tough to get them. Sorry? Grass mats very difficult to get. Difficult to get. That's what I'm saying. They're difficult to get. But these... In... Uh, in Bengal, they have one kind which is called shital pati, which means very cool. Pati means mat, and shital means cool. But this is uh, this plastic one is we can say is garam pati. Or <laughs> it's 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 hot, isn't it? It increases the heat. Just the opposite. So if you can find that, that's nice. And actually, all these things. It, it creates an atmosphere of sattva 
if you're living in a house made of mud or wood, natural materials, and the lighting is by the oil lamp, and the, uh, the all these things, it, it creates an atmosphere of sattva guna, which helps to make the mind peaceful and pure. So these things are not essential for Krishna consciousness. You can be Krishna conscious in any situation, but this culture is very helpful for cultivating Krishna consciousness. So it will be good if ISKCON can take the lead in this. ISKCON means ISKCON devotees, which means you and me. And uh, this farm community, at least you should know that this was one of Prabhupada's very dearest desires. We don't hear much about it nowadays because I don't know why exactly, but uh, there's not much endeavor to promote this concept because it is difficult, no doubt. Mostly people, they don't want to make the break from city life to village life, but it, this is something that Srila Prabhupada very much wanted and devotees who are willing to do that will definitely uh, attract the mercy of Srila Prabhupada by doing so and by showing this example we can show people actually you can live very simply and happily and chant Hare Krishna. There's no need to live this stressed out carcinogenic way of life. We can show. Actually, it's a better way of life. People will be surprised. They'll come and say, well, how are you living so simply? It's very nice. So it's an important part of preaching also. Anyway, there are many things could be said about this, and I have said many things about this on many occasions, but I won't speak more about it now. I'll ask if there are any questions or comments anyone like, would like to make. Do you have this... Uh, Cordless mic? Do you have that? No? No. All right. Well, if you have a question, then it might be better to write it down and pass it up, then I can read it out. We have an extension mic. <coughs> okay. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. You mentioned about the devotees coming in. You left your bead bag? Don't forget your bead bag. You mentioned about the devotees strength increasing as the prasadam time arrives. Yeah. And we do have the same situation. I know. 8, 8.45 to 9.15, the strength almost doubles. Mm. So, what is your suggestion to see how we can package the Krishna consciousness that the devotees do find it attractive to come in the later block and sit through the class and then have a shower? Well, I'm also not sure about trying to make it too attractive. There's a danger there also. There is a danger if we try to make it too attractive that it will become cheap. Because at least the lecture, we want there should be some substantial message. If, it's, if, if the lecture is just, you know, jokes and stories, more people might come, but they won't get any substantial message. So, we, we can't expect everyone will be attracted to that, but that should be available. One thing that's very attractive and can be substantial also is dramas. If dramas are arranged, many people like to come for dramas. 
and we, the message of Krishna consciousness can be conveyed in a form which is attractive. And it doesn't, drama doesn't, it, often we think dramas have to be like jokes and this and that, but they can be very uh, sober also. So there's a suggestion. But uh, the lectures, they should generally be following Srila Prabhupada's example. Prabhupada, he always gave philosophical lectures, actually. Sometimes he would tell some short story just to, just to demonstrate some philosophical point. But Srila Prabhupada definitely wasn't an entertainer. You can see the videos of his lectures and mostly he closed his eyes when he lectured because he was just absorbed in concentrating on what to say to 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 uh, become a a conduit for Gauravani. Now, if we see books on pub or go to a seminar on public speaking, one of the things they'll tell you is that the worst thing you can do is close your eyes. But Prabhupada did almost always. So, so Prabhupada's lectures, um, he was concerned with delivering the absolute truth in the form of sound. And those who were willing to hear it, they were benefited. Of course, Srila Prabhupada did speak differently according to the level of his audience. You'll find his early lectures in 1966 in New York, they were on a more simple level than his later lectures. But they were always very grave. And they definitely weren't meant for, you know, trying to capture a, a public, a popular audience. Prabhupada, in, um, he would arrange programs in such a way that they would be attractive to the public in general. In as much, one thing he did was brought his dancing white elephants, as he called them, to India. His Western devotees, which were a big attraction and still an attraction in India, because people are, think that Westerners are something very important. Although according to Shastra, birth in India is more valuable for spiritual life. Once even Srila Prabhupada performed the marriage of two of his Western disciples on stage in a panda in Bombay. He arranged the marriage. He said, here, you, Vegavan, you from Sweden, you marry this young lady from Australia. I can't remember her name. Padmavati or something like that. So Prabhupada, he's, he married them on stage. He performed the, the wedding ceremony on stage and Prabhupada said this is the real United Nations <laughs> and people really appreciated that so this kind of thing can be done but yeah you can you, you could, but the uh, the lecture that should be conveying serious a serious message there can be also, maybe on different, different days of the week, there could be, uh, maybe if there's some devotee who's qualified, they could tell, uh, recite Mahabharat. They could go through that and giving some Krishna conscious insight on that also. I uh, suggested devotees in Baroda do that and it became a, a big success. More people come than for the regular classes because people like to hear stories. But that shouldn't be the daily or the only kind of lectures that we have. So, preaching means that we have to try to make some contact with people on the level of consciousness they're at now and bring them up. So if we only speak, or 
or, or if we're not aware of people's needs, then we can't actually preach to them. If you do, so we have to make some contact and bring them up. But my understanding is that we should always present Krishna consciousness at a level a bit above that which people are presently at. Because if we present it at the level they're at now, then they'll never come up. You have to have something for them to come up to. So if we simply, if we're... Attractiveness, yes, we should consider how to make it attractive. But at the same time, we shouldn't be so much concerned with attractiveness that we make it cheap. So keeping a balance is very important. And ultimately, quality is more important than quantity. Bringing in many people who are not very serious is not as desirable as bringing in less people who are actually serious about Krishna consciousness. As Srila Prabhupada would quote, Ekas chandras tamo hanti kingna tara gano picha one moon is sufficient to light the sky. What is the need of many stars? Yeah, is there anything else? Maharaj, when there is stress, we know the importance of stress-free life. Similarly, when there is... There's no such thing as stress-free life. Uh, in the... In the in the material world, there's always some stress. On the same way, uh, when there there's is always distress. When there is city but, the, but the present society, it's uh, concentrated stress, too much for human welfare, mentally and physically also. People get physical diseases even from the stress. Yeah. Then? Uh, my question was, so when there is stress, there is a stress-free, uh, we know the importance of stress, less stress. So, uh, now is this material manifestation, a deliberate arrangement by Lord Sri Krishna, so that we appreciate the spiritual life as compared Is it a deliberate arrangement? Does God put us into distress so that we can become more spiritual? No, not exactly. But it is a... Kali Yuga is one Yuga which is given for all sinful people to be all nasty to each other because they have that propensity to be nasty to each other and because they have that propensity they deserve to experience the nastiness of others. So this is Kali Yuga. But there is a quality of Kali Yuga also that Kaling Sabhajyantyarya Gunagya Sarabhagina Yatra Sankirtana Neva Sarva Swarto Bhilabhyate. Persons who are actually expert in discerning the essence, they worship Kali Yuga. Because in this age, simply by performing Sankirtan, one can achieve all the goals of life, or all necessities. <coughs> so, the whole material world is meant to waken people to their constitutional position of serving Krishna. And the distress which comes in this material world is uh, supposed to awaken one to Brahma Jignasa. Atato Brahma Jignasa. This is the beginning of genuinely human life. That when one sees that this material world is full of distress, then an intelligent person will inquire about spiritual reality, about an existence beyond distress. So in Kali Yoga, people in general are not very intelligent. Spirit or spiritually inclined, but the intensity of the distress may awaken some of them to inquire about 
existence beyond distress. So it, it has a function. Although it's not deliberate, it's not that God is deliberately putting people into distress. Rather, that distress is a result of our own sinful activities, but Bhagavan kindly manages it in such a way that it may be conducive for our spiritual advancement if we have any sincerity to take to that. Alright, my question is, uh, now ISKCON has uh, been established as a spiritual organization. What about the giving education also, like from the, from the child age itself? So that, uh, education. Yes, mm. along with the well, Srila Prabhupada had always, about education, Srila Prabhupada always quote, as he did in his preface to Srimad Bhagavatam, right at the beginning of his Bhagavatam presentation, Komara Acharet Pragyot Dharman Bhagavataneha. Durlabham Manushan Janma Tadapya Dhruva Maratadham. That knowledge of Bhagavad Dharma should be inculcated from the very beginning of life, because human life is temporary, but it's very valuable because one can imbibe this knowledge. So Srila Prabhupada set up gurukuls for teaching spiritual knowledge, and he was specifically was very much against government curricula. So that's something else which I was talking about farms, so. Um, Spiritual education is also required. That's one of the projects or programs that Prabhupada set up, which has, unfortunately, at the present stage of ISKCON has been m more or less abandoned as being something impractical at the modern age. Now, people say, some of our devotees say, well, you see, everyone may not want to be, the children may grow up and they may not want to be fully into Krishna consciousness, they may want to get jobs and this and that. But Srila Prabhupada said that we're not going to train people to go out and do service. Specifically said that. So, it may be perceived as some kind of pragmatism to teach the government curriculum. But Srila Prabhupada was not at all in favor of that. So, Srila Prabhupada, he was talking about devotees who are fully dedicated. They could send their. Fully dedicated means they're part of a Vaishnav community and their, their means of sustenance and all that is interlinked with their service in the Vaishnava community, not that they're doing some service outside. Srila Prabhupada didn't insist or expect that every devotee would be like that. He recognized that many devotees would be like yourselves, uh, earning their income in the secular world. But he also wanted schools in which devotees like yourself could send their children to and they can learn about Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada was, you could say, uh, presenting a very extreme form of Krishna consciousness, that our means of living, our education system, everything should be fully focused on Krishna. Yes, Srila Prabhupada was extreme because Krishna consciousness is extreme. If we don't take to Krishna consciousness, then we spoil our lives. Mridehama adang sulabang sudo labam prabang sukalpo guru karna dharam mayanu kulena napas viteritam. Puman Bhavabding Nataretsa Atmaha. Lord Krishna states that having got this human form of life, which is like a boat which is suitable for crossing over the ocean of material existence, having got a good captain of the boat in the form of the spiritual master, having got the favorable winds in the form of Krishna's instructions 
the Vedic knowledge. Having got all these advantages, if one fails to cross the ocean of material existence, one is simply committing suicide. So, that's Lord Krishna's outlook. It sounds extreme, but we have to accept it. Krishna consciousness is not a hobby. <laughs> Well, in general, we don't recommend that very much because there's plenty to do in the house. Looking after children is a full-time job and children need looking after. Otherwise, they come home from work and there's no mother, no father and their mother and father becomes the TV or the computer game. There's no food. They have to get food out of the fridge or go to the cafe or something. So, looking after children is important. It's, not, it's also not a hobby. So in, in general we recommend that women, their full-time dedication is for their family and children. Working, it may be. Generally they say nowadays you can't live unless both work. But then if the wife also works, then the, the, there's, uh, you know, the, 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 the children and the family life suffer. So, and once you may gain some more money, but you lose. The, the children, they don't, you know, if they, they don't come home and their mother's not there, and then they just feel no one cares for them. Whereas if the mother's there to welcome them or scold them or whatever, you know, the mother cares. And actually, even if the mother goes to work, then you, you have to spend so much, you have to, spend, you have to have extra clothing for work, and you have to pay for them to go to work, and then because they're not able to cook food, you have to spend more for restaurant food. And much of the income you get is, goes away because you, then you have to have all, you know, microwave oven and you have to have so many things because, and then you're, you're in a rush all the time. The, the, the mother, she's so, you know, she's already got enough work in the home. She has to work outside and then she's more stressed. And, and then when she, when she comes back, you know, the husband's stressed, the wife's stressed, the children are stressed and everyone's stressed. And then the, it's just like a, it's like a, you ever wonder why so many people, you know, their family life is just like some kind of boxing match. <laughs> it's just like they say, the wedding. First of all, there's an engagement ring, then there's a wedding ring, and then there's a boxing ring. <laughs> so, but at least the, the, the women, if they can be a little relaxed, and then they can, they can, uh, you know, husband comes home, he's you know, after work, and he may be a little like this, where the wife is also then, like I say, boxing room. She can say, yes, 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 yes. It's okay, calm down, you know, take... And then, okay, okay. So, in general, I don't... I'm sorry if you don't like what I'm saying, but I think it makes sense. So... Another thing is that, uh, you know, if ladies are working outside, then they're probably interacting with men other than their husband more than with their husband. They spend more, they see men other than that, they're sitting next to someone in the office or working under some boss, and they're interacting with all, they know other men other than their husband more than their husband. That's also not very good. 
So there are various considerations. Yeah, then? Yeah, you may say, well, this is, what's this got to do with Krishna consciousness? But it does affect us. I mean, Krishna consciousness, there's, there are two words there. One is Krishna and the other is consciousness. So, like I was saying, like sitting on the, using the grass mat that's better for our consciousness. Well, all these things affect our consciousness. How we live our lives, if the, how the children are raised. It, it does make a big difference. You may say, well, I'm working to have enough money for the children so that we can pay for their education. But maybe they need their mother at home more than they need the money that she's earning. Maybe they need her, her direct love, which is manifest by her being there to welcome the child home from school. Maybe they need that more than the money she's earning. We find so many children grow up, there's enough money, but there's no love, or there's insufficient. And therefore there are so many problems in society. And we find in modern India also that many children, they're, just, they're also very stressed and they have psychological problems. So I'm not saying the only reason is because the mother is not there to feed them and scold them and pet them and this and that, but it is... Well, it's an important thing. It does make a difference. Otherwise, the home just becomes a joint mess. That's all. Everyone's outside all the time. And they come together and they all eat at different times. Because, you know, the, the, they all come back at different times. There's no... T you know, eating just becomes some kind of function that you put something in. But... When the mother cooks and offers to Krishna and then serves everyone in the family, brings all the family together. So, all these things affect our consciousness. This car is blocking. 234329. 234329, will you please go and remove the car? Nissan car it is. 234. Three, two, nine, Nissan car. Please don't block the way. Maybe it's not one of our congregation. Try in there, maybe someone who's over there. Now, I'm not saying we should condemn women who are working on this and that, but I'm saying that it's something should, that should be considered very carefully. What, what is the actual gain in terms of Uh, having a good family, looking after the children, and progressing toward the goal of life, Krishna consciousness, should be very seriously considered. In the modern age, there's this propaganda, housewife, oh, that's useless. Women should all be airline pilots and, you know, soldiers in the army. They should be boxing champions and Olympic medalists. What about the children? The, nat the natural function of a woman's body is to have children. And the natural, it's natural for women to want to be mothers and to look after their children. But in the modern age, the very bad propaganda, oh, that's all stupid, looking... Oh, what do you want to be a housewife for? You should be a... You should be a CEO of a, of a MNC. Better you look after your children than be having so many ambitions. Yeah. This is regarding the charity. We understand that the charity should be given in the right place for the right person at the right time. Yeah. I'm here. <laughs> I'm not greedy. I'm not a greedy Brahmana. I, I can honestly say that 
I whatever Lakshmi I get, I spend it in Krishna's service and I don't spend it on sense gratification. And I'm just saying this now because I have a big printing project coming up. So if you'd like to donate, you're welcome. It won't be misused. Sometimes we face uh, people like the customers that need to be formed. Sorry? The question. Yeah, I, I couldn't hear exactly what you were saying. Uh, the question is sometimes we are faced with the people who are cursed by the nature, the deformed body. Cursed by nature. Well, it's not really that. It's uh, their own prarabdha karma. Yeah, they, they may be deformed or mentally retarded or this and that. Traditionally, such people were looked after in their own family. And, uh, yeah, poorer people than those who are richer, they would help in various ways. So that may be. But charity should be given in such a way that helps people to come to Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, what's the point? There's no end of charity. You know, there's there are thousands of charitable organization, save the whale. In England or America, if someone beats a dog, there'll be, you know, be a massive protest. So looking after stray dogs, then there's the paraplegics, and then the uh, can cancer research, AIDS research, there's no end to it. So, I wouldn't, it, it's not a very good idea to try to help everyone who's in a materially less advantaged position than yourself. Because how much can you help them anyway? The best charity is to spread Krishna consciousness, which will help. You see, someone's got some physical defect. But we've all got the spiritual defect of not being Krishna conscious, which is much worse. Someone who's got, uh, you know, say they're a polio victim and their one leg is shorter than the other. But if they're chanting Hare Krishna, they're in a much better situation than someone who's an Olympic gymnast who's not chanting Hare Krishna. So the real need is to give people Krishna consciousness. Yeah, so? In that unavoidable instance, if we give the charity, is it favorable or not? If you give charity just for the sake of their body, then what's the point? How does it help them ultimately? The, real, the best and only really substantial help we can get is to raise people to the platform of Krishna consciousness. So we're not saying that all what we call disadvantaged people should be neglected. But if charity is to be given, that should be done in a way that helps to bring them to Krishna consciousness. But nowadays anyway, there are government schemes and different charities. And why should you bother with that? And unless you have someone in your family who's like that, then it's your duty to look after them. But otherwise, whatever little time or income or you have that could be used to help others, it's better to use it by spreading Krishna consciousness, using your resources to spread Krishna consciousness. If we think that we can actually help anyone in any really meaningful way by giving them anything except Krishna consciousness, then we ourselves don't understand what Krishna consciousness is. Yeah. In your during the class, you said uh, sixteen rounds of chanting it will take hardly for an hour. Uh, what is uh, is there any specific timing? Which There's no specific timing. It's not that you have to look at your watch and time it. But it's just, when speaking physically, to pronounce, just in terms of physical analysis, to pronounce the Hare Krishna mantra 
in a manner that it it's not too fast that it becomes slurred. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Hare. Or it's not so not extremely slow and drawn out. In other words, if it's chanted in a at a moderate speed, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Then to chant sixteen rounds at that speed, or maybe a little slower, will take a minimum of one and a half hours. It's just a just a fact. That's all. It's not that we have to time it. Yeah. Yes, Sorry, Bhagavad Gita means Kru- Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. Closing eyes? Well, there is in the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, there is a description of the uh, not fully closing the eyes, partially closing the eyes. But Arjuna, that, that's the system of yoga is described, that shucho deshe patishta apya, all this, one should go to a purified place. But, but I, I, just a minute, I'm not going to take your question because it's actually... You're basing it on a mistaken premise. But then Arjuna rejects that system of yoga as being impractical. And Krishna, at the end of that sixth chapter, says that yogi nama pi sarve shadhavan bhajate yoma same yuktatam omataha. That the topmost yoga, or the topmost yogi, is one who worships me in full faith. So whether one's eyes are closed or open or half open, as it's mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, the point is to concentrate on Krishna. And the yoga system, as outlined by Krishna in the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, is uh, Arjuna rejected as impractical for himself. Arjuna, who is a much greater person than any of us, so the real yoga is to not just concentrate on Krishna, but shadhavan bhajate yoma, to with full faith to worship Krishna, not simply concentration. Concentration is passive, and bhaja, bhajan, that is active, active service to Krishna. Devotional service, yeah, bhakti. Could you please speak in the mic? Then we yeah. can all hear. My other question is this, that then we will become old. What if we will not be in a condition to chant or sing anything? We won't be able to concentrate on doing anything. Then this all simply wrong, everything will be flat. Finally, what should we do that time? What should we do in old age when we can no longer chant Hare Krishna? If we practice, if we seriously practice bhakti throughout our lives, then even when the bodily functions become uh, decrepit due to old age, then due to purification, our mind will remain fixed on Krishna. And if we have seriously practiced bhakti throughout our lives, if still we, due to the strong influence of bodily decay, Somehow or other, we forget Krishna. Krishna will not forget us. So we should practice bhakti very seriously and depend upon Krishna. And Krishna will help us if we are sincere. What does uh, Kula Shekhar Maharaj say in this regard? Krishna Tvadiya Pada Pangaja Panjarantam What does it go? Adhyayva me vishudu manasaraja hangsa then prana prayana kantava rodhanam svaranam kutaste yes he prays 
that very beautiful actually the language is that my dear Lord may I die now because at the time of death or, or how will I be able to remember you if the if the yeah the, the, the throat is blocked by cough so may the swan of my mind enter into the lotus feet the Krishnaya Pada Pankaja Panja. Yeah the the, the cage, it literally means like a cage, maybe entrapped. Mana Saraja Hansa. Just just like the swan may wrap his neck around the lotus stem. So he's praying like that. Then maybe I may I be absorbed in you before I come to such a condition. But anyway, that's a fact that Krishna will not forget his devotee. Better practice now. Hmm. It's not only Indian culture, it's human culture. Okay, human culture. It's just that in other parts of the some parts of the world they're inhuman nowadays. Currently, uh, I think most of the children they don't take care of the parents. They don't take care of the parents, right? Yeah. That's modern life. Everyone's becoming selfish. And uh, old age homes are old age homes, yeah. Stick them in an old age home. It's like a prison. It's like a prison. You go there to die. What is your advice? Our advice is that the uh, parents should be Krishna conscious, the children should be Krishna conscious. And the children will appreciate that my parents have done so much for me and they'll want to take their guidance and as, as, as being mature devotees who can help me. Now, one thing, in the modern age, children don't respect their parents. And one reason is that there's nothing to respect in the parents' behavior. Previously, the parents, they would be, they would be very concerned about behaving properly and by their own behavior, teaching their children to behave properly. But if the parents themselves, are, you know, they're more interested in going to parties and watching, you know, vulgar things on TV and being just absolutely trivial and selfish and they're not con they're not concerned they think that just by giving some money to their children that's their duty finished but they don't set a good example then the children will just think well money's more important than proper behavior and uh, they won't respect the parents there's no there's nothing to respect them for you just can't say you should respect your parents but naturally the children will respect their parents if the parents act in a respectable way. And naturally they won't respect them if the parents act in a, themselves in a very selfish way. The children learn it from their parents. So if the parents are selfless, then the children are more likely to be selfless. Hmm. Then, what else? Yeah, there's more questions coming. And if the parents are abandoned by the children, then go and live in Vrindavan. How will I live? Don't worry, Krishna will look after you. Thank you so much. Can you give us some details on your printing project? <coughs> on what, sorry? On the printing project which you are telling now. Yeah, uh, for the last 23 years I've been working on a book on Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sosrai Thakur. It's laid out now and proofreading is going on. Uh, it's in three volumes, 600 pages each. Five to 600 pages each. I want to print it first class quality. I'm not sure how much it'll cost. It'll be about 30 to 50 lakhs. And uh, I do have some Lakshmi because I've been printing books. But uh, 
If anyone has 50 lakhs in their back pocket, they'd like to donate, they're welcome. If not, all donations are accepted. And many others. Actually, I have to print many books and I have to write them. I actually, I want to stop coming to Bahrain and everywhere else and just sit in one place and write. Just like I'm telling all these things about family life, some some general idea now. And I think some of you will appreciate that there are some important points there, isn't it? But isn't it that if we had all these points collected and systematically presented in books, that would be something very valuable, isn't it? And that would go all over the world and then, you know, I'm not going to live very long. But even after I pass away, that will continue. So I think it's better to stop traveling and just write books. And then that, that will be actually more, better contribution. So, this writing books is actually very, there are many important things. There are actually dozens of books I want to write on very, many important topics based on what Srila Prabhupada has given us. Just like I wrote this book, Brahmacharya and Krishna Conscious, collecting points from Prabhupada's teachings and putting them together systematically. So like this Beginner's Guide to Krishna Conscious. And these books have helped many people in coming up in Krishna Consciousness. So there are many things to do. Like this. So I have many books to write. But I don't know because time is passing on, moment by moment. Yeah, then, anything else? Hello. Maharaj, uh, as you give the example of the village life, that we are more close to each and we are more close to God. But, I mean, because I was in the village, but now looking at the today's... The Indian villages today are full of corruption, Politics, illicit sex, intoxication, and every other bad thing you can think of. That's true. Now they're having shopping malls coming in the village also. They're selling the, they're selling the cows. They don't protect the cows. They use, they use them and sell them. It's considered a normal thing. So the culture is very much broken down. So when I'm talking about village life that Prabhupada envisaged, it's not exactly like the modern Indian village, but rather more like Nanda Gokul, Nanda Maharaj's Gokul Dham. That's the model we want. We're not talking about making villages where people can play cards and fight with each other and drink daru and all this kind of thing. And the, the, the politicians come and they make a project for making a road two lakhs and stick one and a half lakhs in their pocket and we're not interested in this kind of thing. So, sir, I mean, needs were very less uh, in those days, but now you have the pressure of giving academic education to children. And as we don't want to give academic education to children. That just, that just, that just prepares them to become a, another rat in the rat race. We want to give Krishna conscious education. It's a con Prabhupada's vision was to cut out of this society, with this modern civilization, which destroys all the good qualities of the human being. You don't need money. If we produce our own food and education is free, and anyway, you don't need all this, this heavy pressure education that the children, they have to go to school with like a stack of books like this high. They don't need this. Potter's son becomes a potter. Barber's son becomes a barber. The girls learn in the home from the age of three or how to cook. The Brahmin boys, they study. And they, they study, that's academic, but that's religious academics, or spiritual academics. 
So it's a completely different approach to life. But because of the, the modern culture makes us think that if you don't have an education, you can't live. Unless you get a job, you can't, unless you find someone to give you some money in exchange for work, you can't live. This is a shudra mentality. If I remember very well, Maharaj, if my memory serves me well, Maharaj, I think Maharaj came 1988 to Bali, and that time Maharaj, he was writing the book. No, it wasn't 88. 88. It wasn't 88, no, because I took sannyas in 89. It was after I took sannyas that so I first came. 90, 90, maybe 91, more, maybe 91, like that. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I think that time you were writing the book, Maharaj. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't bring Ramayana, no. I don't usually bring because it's quite a big, heavy book and. and uh, that time I and you can't carry so many. Mm. Dr. Prabhu's wife was typing Maharaj book. And I'm not sure which book it was, but she did quite a lot of work for typing the book and all this. So Maharaj has done, from there onwards, Maharaj has done a lot of work in writing the book in service of Prabhupada and the mission is gone. So, there are so many books, Maharaj's books on sale, and Maharaj's lecture on CD. So please come forward if you are interested, as well as come forward and accept prasadam from Maharaj. Yeah. This, this book, Glimpses of Traditional Indian Life, I think some of you have this. That's uh, like in what I was talking about today, about that culture. It gives many insights into the traditional culture and how nice it was. So that's available here. This uh, pilgrimage in holy India, that's a visit to many holy, many tirthas. You can make an armchair yatra. Or actually what happens is many people after reading this, they make the real yatra because they think, I want to go there too. And the Brahmachari book, that's good for Grihastas also, so the Grihastas tell me. And Vamsidas Babaji is one book I wrote, which it's the describing about one extraordinary devotee called Vamsidas Babaji. Where's that book, uh, Jai Srila Prabhupada? Do we have any copies of that left? Finished. Okay. Yeah, we have uh, books here in about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Telugu and Gujarati. And other books available in Hindi. And CDs of lectures, if you'd like to take CDs of lectures, they're available in English, Hindi and Bengali. Because I give lectures in Hindi also, sometimes. A lot of time, because I live in India, and still more people speak Hindi than English, although the way it's going, probably soon there'll be more people speaking English than Hindi. In Bombay, I think there's only one Marathi school, Marathi medium school, there's only one left. Otherwise, everyone sab paka sahib ban gaya hai sab. Ham English bolte. Sharam se kaho ham Hindi samaste. They are ashamed to speak Hindi. Actually, everyone should speak Sanskrit. That's better. Better than Hindi. They should have, Prabhupada said, they should have made the national language Sanskrit. That was a debate at the time of India's political independence, whether to make what the national language should be. And some wanted to make it Sanskrit. It would have been better. Anyway, it's too late now. They made, well, it's not too late. We can say. Introducing Sanskrit is not 
essential for Krishna consciousness, but it's it's better. It's the language of Shastra. So all of us, we're probably too old. No, well, we can still do it. But uh, maybe like in these gurukuls that we have to start, then the children can learn Sanskrit. And if, if we learn Sanskrit, then we become Sanskrita. Sanskrit means Shishta. Sanskrita means Sanskarkrita. Sanskar and Sanskrit, they come from the same root. All right, so Hare Krishna. Yeah, please uh, take some books and read them. Did you, did you keep one? I'll keep for Kuwait at least one. Yeah? Hare Krishna, Maharaj is leaving to Kuwait tomorrow afternoon, so there will be a class in the morning, 8 to 9. So please, avoid this opportunity, don't miss it. And I request Prabhuji to start coming in an orderly manner and accept prasadam from Maharaj. When do we have the Matajis first? Usually we do that, isn't it? Yeah. Matajis first? Is it? Mataji, so we will give the preference to Mataji as director. So Mataji, please come forward and accept Prasanna. Well, we can have two lines, isn't it? Men here and ladies here. Okay, we have two lines. Oh, already signed. Okay. Already signed.